Welcome to another Learning Council podcast. This is your host, Leilani Coffin, publisher at Learning Council News Media and Research. Um, our topic today is teacher retention, criticality. I love that word, criticality. I had to throw that one in there. Um, it's a big deal right now. So I have with me my two new friends <clears throat> who are uh, Joseph Jones and TJ Vari. Joseph, you're a current superintendent. TJ, you've held executive administrative positions in schools. I want to I want to have both of you give like a little short bio of of yourselves so that we can dig into this topic. All right, Joe, can I have ask you to go first? Yeah, thank you for having us, Lilani. So quick bio started as a social studies teacher after five years, became an assistant principal, then moved up to the principalship. Then I was director of assessment accountability. And now this is my sixth year as superintendent. So it's been a fun ride. Typically, my time in those positions were between five and seven years uh, as I moved through. And um, this is my 29th year in education. Wow. Impressive. OK, good. All right. And TJ. Sure thing, Leilani. I was an assistant principal, a principal, obviously a teacher before that, a deputy superintendent, spent the last 10 years building pathways for students. Um, college and career readiness was really the focus. And now I work as uh, director of product strategy at My Learning, M A I A Learning, where I'm helping the team in 74 countries with college and career readiness with a college and career readiness planning tool. Well, that's great. Okay, good. I want to hear about more of that too sometime. Um, all right. So you guys have, were impressive because what you were talking about when I was out there um, was really about what's going on with teacher you know, the whole teacher landscape. So let me just throw some data out there and then I want to have you go. And I want to make sure we mention all your books. These are two of them, but we're going to bring up all six titles and I'll make sure that they're in the description so people can find them online. But I have been talking about teacher, uh, the the attrition of teachers, the, you know, the boomers were all retiring even before the pandemic and then they seem to all jump out almost all at the same time. And now even some of the Gen Xers are starting to retire. Um, and we weren't getting it, as many as we needed out of the colleges anyway. They were only graduating like 17,000. We need just under a million right now. And the data is showing that we're not going to see any huge bump in gaining them all the way through 2030. So right now, the United States needs somewhere around 3.3 million. And then you've also got this issue of teachers going, you know, I'm just going to gig teach now. I'm just going to be online and gig teach like a tutoring thing, a lot of tutoring companies, or um, I, I, I'm just, you know, I, I'm i going to sort of like put my head down and not do things that my superintendent wants right now because I'm headed for retirement. So there's a lot of issues here. So, okay. So I want you guys to talk about this. What are, what are some of what you've come up with? Cause there's a lot going on. Joe, you want to go first? Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. So you're absolutely right. The landscape of education has changed, is changing, but you're also right. This goes back all the way to the 1970s. Like the yeah. trend line demonstrates that less and less people are going into education um, for a variety of reasons. And so we do see this attracting teachers into the profession is harder than ever. Um, TJ mentioned a lot of his work with career pathways, but a lot of what he did in his previous school district and what I've done as well in my school district is trying to build a pipeline of teachers from, you know, high school right into to the profession because Alana, we have to change things up or we will never fill those positions. Yes, I agree. And TJ, do you see, because you're doing some international work, I mean, other countries pay way better than we do. Um, and they have sort of a different stature to it, right? There's a respect there that is very different. Not every country, right? But what do you see? Yeah, I think there's a prestige to being a teacher in a lot of countries where they are retaining and they see more people going in the pr profession because it's just widely respected by the culture. And so I think we can get there in the U.S., but we've got some work to do. Yeah, I totally agree. I think that we have a long way to go. I actually brought that up with one city that was rolling for and you guys were in baltimore with me so um and it, and we were getting the tail end of the hurricane that day right so it was a <laughs> it was quite a day but i i don't remember what other city it was but i i remember bringing up the fact that you know we've had this culture right now of having um 
you know, promoted the fact that teacher salaries are very low for a really long time. And so a lot of people don't want to be teachers because they think like, why am I going to waste my whole life getting paid almost nothing? But they don't necessarily realize that there's pensions at the end of that. And it's 20 years to pension, right? Like normally and uh, full salary for the rest of your life. And there's really great uh, health care, which no industry has anymore outside of, you know, the public sector. So there's there's other things, right, like that you can talk about. Are you talking about them? Is this does this come up? I think we often try to paint a really accurate picture of the benefits of going in education. So, you know, and you can make a very good salary. The problem is, Lana, it just takes forever to get there. And oh. so when you're competing with other industries that just start. So, you know, TJ and I are coming to you from Delaware. Um, the state police right now, I believe they start around 80000 with a $10,000 signing bonus. We don't, our average incoming salary is about 43000 for mm. a new teacher. So mm. it's very hard to compete when you have other industries that start off high. So you can get there. We have a number of teachers that are making a great living who are building towards your pension. Um, now in Delaware, it's roughly about 50% after time after 30 years but mm. the health benefits are great but i think other industries caught on to that but i do want to go back to what your previous question because a lot of the data reveals that teachers aren't always necessarily in it for the money it's a noble profession they'll take the pay cut if they're respected and appreciated and part of something with a great purpose somehow though the narrative has gotten so strong in America, particularly, that schools just aren't getting it done. I would argue schools are doing more than ever. And we saw mm -hmm. that in COVID. Yeah. Schools are the hub of the community. The challenge, though, is when you feel all of that pressure, you feel all of the need within the community, we may not have the academic results that everyone is looking for at the time they're lo looking for it, but we need support, not divisiveness. And so yeah. if we could start switching, I think that's really what's going to attract people back to this profession. Dangling that carrot will only attract so many people. The financial I agree. I, I totally agree with that point. I want to say that that our surveys, our national surveys this year, and then I'm coming to you, TJ. Um, we're showing that the number one issue at the very top, and teachers said this, is that in the population of students and the parents are part of this too. The number one issue is loss of common courtesy. Okay, so there's been a cultural shift to lose all sorts of politeness. I mean, everybody ghosts everybody now. Nobody answers anybody phone calls. They text only. If they email you back, it's a miracle, right? I mean, it's just a it's a world out of communication and uh, nonverbal and won't communicate. And if they do, they're yelling at you. I get it, Joe. I totally get it. You're totally right. And I don't know. It is it is sort of an interesting thing that's all your fault. Right. Like, no, 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 no. This is a this is a social, you know, society wide cultural shift. Um, but you are the guys that are going to be tasked with changing it. Right. Of course. Of course. And you're brave. You're going to do it anyway. Right. OK, so, TJ, what are your thoughts? Well, I'm, I'm always going to go back to school leadership every single time, Leilani. I think, you know, we need to build the capacity of our school and district leaders to be able to do this work. We only do that through masterminds, coaching, making sure people are involved in groups. You can't pour from an empty cup. So that's why we wrote all the books that we've we've written. That's why our blog is popular. Our podcasts are popular because school leaders need to build their own capacity. The system's probably not going to do that for you, school leaders, anybody who's a, a leader now listening. But we've got to do it for ourselves. Um, that's the only way we're going to build a culture um, of strength where we yeah. protect teachers. We got to protect their time. We got to protect them from what you're discussing with the lack of respect. Whatever the case may be, our teachers need to feel a sense of belonging in the school, that they belong there and that they are protected by great leaders, protect people. And so yes. we need to build our leaders up so that they can do that. Yeah. And I've been in organizations like that. I've been called in if there's like a tiff between more than one person and uh, the leader cares enough to go, hey, you guys got to work this out. Right. You got to work this out because 
work is not just work, it's emotion, right? It's it's hugely emotional, especially when you got kids all running around and they're doing crazy stuff, right? Um, but if you have additional sort of things happening between the adults, you know, like there's arguments or there's just, it's just like a toxic environment. I mean, you're, you're not going to get over that, right? So you almost have to have leaders that are just, they're going around and, and, and I'm not saying hugging everybody all the time, but they stand there like a good dad or mom and they're just like there for you, just giving you the look, right? Like, I get you, right? Like, I'm there for you silently behind you. I, can you guys talk about that a little bit, Joe? Because I know that's huge for why people stay anywhere, like retention wise. What do you, what What are you up to? Yeah, I think that's a great point. People want to belong. They want to feel that people care about them. I just spoke to a couple hundred students today. It's we celebrate Unity Day in our district um, on this day. And so big part of my my talk was actually on a, an example that I read about a while ago about a, a woman at MIT who, you know, I don't know the accuracy of the story in stone, but ultimately the lady wasn't leaving her her job because of what was happening to her. She was leaving solely because no one ever asked her how she was. And I don't think that's a knock necessarily on the school or so, but it's a reality that if we don't feel belonging and we don't feel purpose, we can quickly feel isolated and alone. When you lump something on top of that, like, you know, the rude behavior or like you know, situations that are toxic, it only makes it worse to retain our great teachers. You know, we want them to feel that they are supported, that they have the resources to do their job well, and that they have the freedom, the autonomy to like live out being a professional. And those are things that have been eroded over time that like, as TJ said, great leaders protect their teachers from and let them do their job. There's no more important space in the classroom and we have to lead like it. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. TJ. Yeah. I mean, I'll just add, I'll give a, an example, but I'll, I'll, I'll add to what, what Joe is saying that the leader's job is to pr protect the people. And I'm first and foremost, always going to go back to a customer service centric uh, environment, uh, a culture, and the kids are the customer and the families are the customer. So don't get me wrong with what I'm about to say, but at some point the teacher is the number one customer for the school leader, because if the teachers aren't whole, they can't serve the, the students and their families. With that said, I think five or 10 years ago, when you got a, a, a mean email from a parent, the response might've sounded something like, I'm sorry that you feel that way with you know, some solutions on the back end. I think right now I've seen school leaders who respond to those mean emails with, you're not going to talk to my teachers that way. And if you want to talk to somebody, you can come talk to me like that, but you're definitely not going to talk to my teachers that way. And I think that's the kind of mentality that's going to build a culture where teachers feel like, oh, I'm cared about and cared for. And I'm not going to, I'm not subject to some of, of the nastiness that you were mentioning before, Leilani. Yeah, and it's, it's definitely a situation. I mean, just this last survey in August, when we, we did a survey called Preparing for New Futures, and 88% of the teachers were asking for student discipline solutions. I mean, that is not part of what was the previous generations. Right. I mean, there's just been a huge shift. I mean, I don't think really America understands the vastness of this shift. Even when I was in Dallas two days ago, I was talking to that group about the fact that our numbers are showing is 15 to 40 percent in every classroom is off grade level work. Meaning they're if it's a language class, they're like three, four, five, six grades behind or more um, or they're slightly ahead or way ahead. Right. So you're sitting standing there trying to teach a seventh grade class and there's a bunch of kids in your class that are like, you know, they they doesn't they don't know how to decode a word. They're not reading at all. And you're trying to get them to write essays. And then other ones are bored because they're on the 12th grade level of reading and writing. And then you've got also a, this is the first time this year where foreign language students rose as a number as a huge issue. Right. Like so you've, you're facing down to kids that. They're, they're speaking and, and listening in a foreign language probably only 
usually, and they don't even read and write in that language. And you're trying to teach them to do a seventh grade essay. This is really hard, right? I mean, this is happening all over America. I know you guys are probably facing it somewhat. I'm not sure how much, but I, it, it's definitely an issue. If you're not going to stand behind them emotionally, I mean, God help you. Like, it's, it would be really hard. I would quit. I know I would. I'd probably be in a tither, right? Okay, so I think some of the other things that you wanted to talk about, Joe, were like these, these uh, how you attract them, and then these first to fifth years teachers who who are known to like bug out early because they find out it's hard, right? So let's talk about that for a minute. Yeah, it's it's good, and the profession's always been hard. It's a question of whether or not it's insurmountable. And it and it's not. And so that's where we have to bring it back to hard. You know, the people I work with day in and day out, the, the great educators in our school district and in our state, and that I've met fortunately across the nation, most of them are willing to tackle challenges. Most of them are willing to try things out and really work. But we also need support. And I would like to go back, you know, to some of this idea of community support to make this happen. So that mm -hmm. that vulnerable time is year one through five where it's hard. But when people feel abandoned, of course, they're going to bail. But if you can build that level of support, but it also needs to be community support, because what you just described, Leilani, about the individuals coming into class seventh grade, and they might be reading on a fourth or fifth grade level, all of the challenges associated the what the, our response to that as a nation is typically well what are the third grade teachers doing and that's wrong that's wrong that's too easy mm -hmm. and leadership is complex as we always say but it's not complicated but you do have to be willing to be honest and really get to the root cause and so rather than blaming let's build a community of support around these teachers and that what that's some things that'll help when you attract teachers just to make sure i answer your question directly you have to build a narrative that is very prominent in the community that you do right by kids and you do right by your staff and celebrate all the great things going on um, we've been very fortunate in our district but we champion as much as possible the great events that occur the great success of, of our students the great successes of our staff because those are taxpayer dollars at work and we want them to see the fruit of their money. And that only continues to build great relationships. And then the community comes on board that snowballs into a momentum of success instead of finger pointing and polarization, which is just way too common in our culture right now. Yes, I agree. I agree. TJ, what are your thoughts? Well, I mean, the first thing I would say is um, to Joe's point about community support. We need community support. We need to come together. There are um, hubs in our community that can help with these things, and we just need to bring everybody to the table. I saw a keynote done by a, a superintendent just after COVID, and I thought it was really insightful. He said, you know what? I'm willing to come to the table. The kids are hungry. There's violence in the community. Whatever it is, they need cl clean clothes. I'm willing to come to the table, but I don't have a cape and I need other people at the table with me. Right. And so I think it's important that school leaders, number one, are candid about that with the community and with their, their own leaders. But to two, you can't take it all on yourself. The test scores are not just the responsibility of the school or the third grade teacher, to Joe's point. And the last thing I'll say about it is if, if we're working in schools right now, the two most vulnerable populations are our new teachers, the one to five years, and our best teachers. And we can't afford to lose them right now. You can't, and that's not to say that every teacher isn't valuable and we don't need all teachers, but the, the fact of the matter is the two populations that are most likely to leave when the culture isn't supportive is the new people and the best people. And there's not a school that I've worked in that can afford that to happen. No. Now you're reminding me when I go to Atlanta, I always hear them whispering to each other about how the, the each each district that's all around the hub of Atlanta poach from each other's. They have like little summer meetings to figure out poaching strategies. Um, yeah, it's very interesting, right? Um, but I think what we come back to, and then we'll sort of wrap this up, and I want to bring up your books, is that a school is a hub of humanness, right? It really is a community function. And I don't think we've 
as a nation, given everyone a hat to say you're part of a community, right? You don't just get services handed out. You got to be participant. It's a participatory de- democratic institution, and and everybody has to put their shoulder to the wheel, and that needs to be said way more often, right? Like it's not just like everybody's against you because you know, like I don't anyway. It's, an, it's a lack of responsibility. During a time where we're undergoing such monumental change, I know you guys heard me talk about this, but I believe all of society right now is shifting to a new place, the same way that we left the agrarian farming age and went to the industrial age. Like everyone was moving to cities. It was a time of great unrest and dirty cities and poverty and things occurring. And now there's... Um, People are exiting cities and going to live in rural America, and it's and it's all different. And we have to live through this. It's hard. So why don't you guys give me your 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 final comments? Like you know, being human and living through this, and then let's go through the titles of your book. I want people to know about these. Lonnie, from the humanness standpoint, my one of my favorite cro- quotes ever is from mother Teresa, and that's just that there's more hunger in this world for love than there is for bread and if we could approach life like that then we'd be significantly better off yes Beautiful. we can have strategies yes we can have a lot of different things mobilize but just the attitude that i will love my neighbor today if we could embrace that, we would see a significant change. The problem is that's significantly harder than most people want to admit, and it takes a lot of effort. But if we just could do that, but I like to think that I lead with that mantra, that quote, um, and then who better to be inspired by someone who dedicated their life to change in Mm -hmm. some of the darkest places on this earth. I love that quote. I'm going to steal that. That's beautiful. (laughs) TJ. I'm going to pick up where Joe left off on change. The definition of, of, of leadership is influence. The challenge of leadership is conflict. The result of leadership is change. And we can't have change without overcoming these conflicts that have arisen in our profession. So we need more leaders. And the leader is the one who goes first. And the leader is the one who is willing to do something that might not work. We can't continue down this path expecting things to be different by doing the same things we've always done. Agreed. Agreed. Well, that's going to lead us to another topic I want to talk with you guys about in another podcast. But let's go over your books because I talked about these in my little like what happened in Baltimore, but I only had two of them. So I had this. The name of your book is Retention for a Change. Motivate, Inspire and Energize Your School Culture. This is not a really long book. This is highly readable in maybe, for me, it would be like maybe a two hours, two, three hours, right? I'm a fast reader. So it's, and it's got a lot of great points. It's structured so that you can get a lot in, in a little bit. Like you give scenarios. You're not just, you're not blogging, right? You're actually giving truth in, in little bunches all the way throughout that. And then you've got another one. Building a winning team, the power of a magnetic reputation, and the need to recruit top talent in every school. This, too, is not a very long book. It talks about reputation. It's written fairly with a lot of, you know, pithiness. It's not, you know, a hard thing to get through, but it's definitely points any leader in any school can walk away from and go, okay, I know how to act now. I know how to do this. It's not just like blah, 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 intellectualism. Okay. All right. So you want to mention the other ones, TJ or Joe? TJ, go ahead. Sure thing. I mean, back to the best teachers, we wrote a book called Invest in Your Best. And um, the subtitle of that is Nine Strategies to Grow, Support, and Celebrate Your Most Valuable Teachers. There's so much we can get from from the best people in our organizations. And unfortunately, they tend to get left alone. And a lot of school leaders will tell you that they don't know what to do with their best teachers. They know what to do with teachers who are underperforming, but they're not sure to do uh, what to do with the best. We hear that in everywhere we go, whether we're keynoting or, or working with school systems. And so that one's okay. available. Go ahead. Okay, stop right there because I want to address that. 
I find that's a ego issue with leaders that they're not used to complimenting other people. They don't walk because they're supposed to be the big honcho. They don't walk around and go, come here. I want, I want to notice you right now. I want to tell you, you are absolutely fantastic. Here's the 10 reasons why. And then come back the next day and do the same thing. I don't think a lot of leaders do that. I, I honestly, I've been around a while. So, you know, I kind of know. What are your thoughts on that, Joe? You're grinning. <laughs> yeah, I think it's interesting. You definitely could have some of the older school draconian folks that, you know, their ego, they they like the title, they lead by the title. Um, I would like to think that's moved away, at least among a lot of the colleagues I'm with. The line, what I've discovered is some people are afraid to compliment because then when it comes time to discipline, they struggle. They struggle to have a bicameral approach to a relationship where they can learn how to praise and improve performance. They but must not be a, married, Joe. They must not. <laughs> Because you got to do both to be married. You got to do both. And that that's actually was our first book, Candid and Compassionate Feedback. And but it was theirs. But I've seen that limitation. Like if I'm if I'm kind and I lead with kindness, what happens when I have to have a tough conversation? You can still be kind. Yes. You can still be. I don't, they're they're not opposites. But in people's mind, they somehow confuse their professional relationship into a personal relationship when you want to make really um, like compliment individuals and praise them. It's still professional. You just anchor that into the vision and mission. That's a whole nother episode, a whole nother podcast. Yeah, but I find that? that to be an Achilles heel of a lot of leaders. Oh, I know that as a CEO. I when I have to fire somebody or discipline somebody, I have somebody else do it, which is a weakness of mine. And I have had to do it. And I did it with love. Right. Um, I think it's a skill set we absolutely have to have you guys do another book on. I'm serious. Right. OK, TJ, you were going to finish off with the other books. Uh, there's two others. Joe mentioned our first one, Candid and Compassionate Feedback, which is really about communication skills. Um, being candid is a skill. Uh, it's not necessarily a, just a trait people are born with. Is that's the misnomer about that. The two other ones that haven't been mentioned are passionate leadership. One of our favorites. We collected stories from all over the country about people who are doing school differently, um, so that leaders could see that there is a way to build the culture that um, that we want to create for students and teachers. And then finally, seven mind shifts for school leaders. That was born from COVID, but it's not a COVID book. It's seven strategies for thinking through problems differently. If you've ever done a SWOT analysis, you know that yes. the, the result of the SWOT helps with your thinking differently about the problem after you do the SWOT than before the SWOT. Well, we offer seven new strategies for school leaders to use to think about problems that have persisted over time. So six books. And you know what, Leilani? You hit the nail on the head. We're working on a seventh book right now that is about communication. Again, we're going back to our roots and we're going to talk about candor for a second time, but also praise, corrective action and what we call professional dialogue. How do we have communication um, in schools where we really have inquiry based understanding of one another and ask yes. questions the right yes. way? There's a wrong way to ask questions. And I, I think I we, get it, we get it mixed up. <laughs> Yeah, I love it. Okay, good. Well, you guys, you know what I would like you to do is because you have the originals for the books, right? Is start releasing one chapter with a give me the image of the book on my uh, news posts, right? Like, so we we take one chapter a week from one or the other, you know, we hear a book or hear a book or there and just put it as an article and we we'll start referring them to your books. And then we can do teasers on your new book. I love it. I would love to collaborate with you. I'm in the middle of writing a new book myself on the human singularity I see coming. Um, you know, I'm a futurist. I love to talk about the future. Um, loved having both of you guys here today. Thank you both so much. TJ and Joe, my new friends. All right. So for everyone that's listening right now, thank you very much for listening to another episode of Learning Council's podcast. This has been your host, Leilani Coffin. Keep listening and keep learning.